going to do a little Q&A with you myself. Okay. And then we're going to open it up um, to the audience and to the Twitter feed and the social media questions that are coming in. Um, and when we go to the audience, um, I would like to ask you to actually ask a question and not give a speech. Okay, I'll cut you off at the pass if it's a speech. If you give a speech, we won't answer you. That's okay. hardening my soft diplomacy. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, my question, first of all, is because this is a journalism school and we also house a, a very highly regarded, one of the best in the country, PR programs, um, what skills did you bring from your life as a journalist to diplomacy? I mean, we're not known for being very diplomatic, you know. Well, right. the PR people probably are, but not us. Well, I, I like to think of myself, because I was a journalist, as an undiplomatic diplomat. And one of the very simple things that I am trying to bring is speed. I mean, the, the State Department doesn't operate on the kind of metabolism that, that journalism does. Um, there's a clearance process at the State Department. So, so one of the things that I encountered is that in, in the social media space where you need to answer people in real time, if you have to get tweets cleared and it takes, even in a very, very accelerated version, takes 24 hours to clear a tweet, you've really lost the initiative. So, so I actually believe, and I, I again talked to the public affairs officers about this last week, that, that for the most part, 95% of what a PA will ever say has already been cleared. It's said by the Secretary of State, said by the President of the United States, said by Jen Psaki from the podium. There's a whole universe of things, for the most part, that you can just say without having it go through the clearance process. So, so that's just one example of, of, of what I've tried to bring, as well as an understanding of how the media ecosphere works. OK. Uh, you, you said that uh, there's an information battlefield that precedes actual battles, that ISIL and Al-Qaeda were very skilled in using social media f for that information battlefield. And I'm, I'm curious what your answer is in terms of responding to that. Is, is public diplomacy now, when you say you're toughening, uh, we need to toughen, is it responding in kind, not with propaganda? Or with propaganda. Well, I mean, the the um, uh, I actually wrote a book about flattery many years ago, and the way uh, the, the way to define flattery was to me. Can you give me an example? Yes. Okay. How? Uh, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> no, go ahead. That, um, that there's a difference between flattery and honest praise. I would say there's a difference between propaganda and us telling people what our policy is. See, to me, the whole point substance of the tool of public diplomacy is to be in support of policy, right? If it's not in support of policy, I'm not sure what it is. So, I'm not, I, so I, I don't think our job is propaganda, which is a misstatement, a false statement about what reality is. I want to communicate what the reality is. This is our policy in, uh, in Palestine. This is our policy uh, in uh, Central America. And to me, this, even this phrase, that winning hearts and minds, is not, is not, that's not a phrase that works for me. We're not trying to win hearts and minds. We're trying to tell people about what our policy is. We're trying to explain what that policy is. We're trying to have a conversation about that policy. And we hope people will understand it. But it's not about winning hearts and minds. That's what I was saying about, uh, at the beginning, is that, is that part of what public diplomacy is having this conversation. So it might be people might come away as like, you know, I, don't, I disagree with President Obama's policy, but I, I like the fact that Americans talk to me about that. I like the fact that they treat me like a citizen and I can understand this. That is part of the values that we're trying to promote, even if people disagree with, with a particular part of our policy. So what one change, before I go to the audience, what one change have you brought as a, as a former journalist and, and somebody who wants to actively use social media in a more powerful way? Well, one of the things we did, and I mentioned seeing the, the uh, kind of Russian information space after the uh, annexation of Crimea, um, we started within our, the Ukraine task force, which was a social media hub in Russian language rebutting Russian propaganda on social media because you know part of it was because these Russian language speakers who were in the region were getting exclusively Russian information so so that now exists uh, it's now pretty formidable it's, it's not as big as the big battalions that the Russians have but it is contesting the space 
about Russian misinformation about Ukraine and Crimea. So that did not exist before, it exists now. You said very smart people were noticing uh, when Al-Qaeda was using social media, ISIL, the Ukraine. Uh, were those very smart people uh, alerting the White House? Were they what, sorry? Were they alerting the White House? Um, well, some of them are in the White House. Hmm. Um, you know, the, the president, I, don't, I forget the actual verb uh, he used uh, um, about, about all of us, you know, as a government, as a nation, as a people, not being as aware and as knowledgeable about the threat of ISIL. So um, it's, uh, it's a, you know, it's a, they're, they're, they're formidable. They're formidable online. Lots of people did know about it. You know, perhaps we could have taken greater precautions. Said so diplomatically. Thank you. Gosh. Uh, okay. I'm going to take a couple of questions. Is it okay to go to the audience now? Yes. What we'd like you to do is come up to this microphone. Um, and first, I'm going to go to a couple of students, if I might, and then go to other folks in the, in the audience. Is there a student who would like to come up and... Yes, there you are. Okay. Um, hi, Dominic. Uh, my name is Robin. I'm actually a master's student in computer science. But uh, I just have a question on how do you prevent countries uh, from censoring the soft power that they're putting? Oh, from censoring soft power? Yeah. Um, For example, like China. <coughs> China. Well, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very large challenge. So you had, for example, um, uh, last week, or, or the weekend before last, uh, the <laughs> government announced that they were canceling the FLEX program, which is a scholarship program for high school students from uh, Eastern Europe. There were 220 places for Russian high school students to come and study in America. They canceled it just like that. So the question is, how, what, how do you respond to something like that? Um, well, part of what we did is we, we made about half of those places available for Ukrainian high school students to come to America. But in this hardening of the soft power space, we have so many countries that they see our soft power manifestations, whether it's educational exchanges or cultural exchanges, as something which we are doing to sabotage the government or to, or to bring the government down, which is not the case at all. But, but in many places in the world, we're, we're combating that. And there is no good answer. I mean, right now, we're doing it on a piece-by-piece on a, on a -piece basis. And, um, but it, it's one of the things that's making public diplomacy harder and harder in the 21st century. Yes, another, any, yes, go ahead, go up to the microphone if you would. Either one, both. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm asking a question on behalf of Tim Rivera, who tweeted in, um, how is it possible that any foreign government or foreign people will interpret any statements by the U.S. government as anything but propaganda? Um, it's, it's a good question. So, and that's relevant both, for example, to the Ukraine task force, which I mentioned, which we recently started, to CSCC. Um, I, I don't think what I'm about to say is a surprise, um, but obviously the U.S. government is not always the best messenger for our message, right? But the fact that it comes from the U.S. government, people automatically interpret it as propaganda. They automatically interpret it negatively. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Because to me, it's, it's more about the enunciation of what our policy is. Here's what we think about this. Or here's why we think that's wrong. You can accept it or not. Um, so, um, so part of the kind of government to government public diplomacy or government to people public diplomacy is we still, we still have to do that. The, the other uh, kind of concentric circle of public diplomacy is how do we empower and enable third parties to talk about some of these issues. So, so you know, I've been tasked to, to lead the anti-ISIL messaging uh, coalition um, from the US in, in, re in response to ISIL. How do we message around what we're doing with ISIL on the ground? Obviously, me saying that ISIL is not the true face of Islam is not terribly persuasive. But having the hundreds of clerics from around the world, from the Middle East, from Indonesia, elsewhere, who have said that ISIL is not the true face of Islam. It's a perversion of Islam. Uh, it goes against everything the, the Prophet stood for. That is much more pervasive. Insofar as our ability to help those people, help people to get a better platform, help people to get a, 
a larger audience, that's part of public diplomacy too. Is it, so when you're heading this coalition, uh, is that your job, is to help them get their voices well, out? Well, part of it is, yes. I mean, it, again, the, it, it is a, it's, it's a problem. I mean, the countries in the coalition, the Arabic countries, realize this is our problem. It's our problem to fix. There are, there's long-term reasons uh, that helped engender it. Uh, you know, high unemployment in the, uh, in the Arab world, young men not working. Um, they understand that the, these are deep problems that, that need to be rectified by themselves. I mean, um, so part, the U.S. being part of that coalition is we want to help those countries deal with those problems themselves and deal with it collectively insofar as that they can form this military coalition. Why can't they form a, a, a kind of public diplomacy coalition to deal with those problems as well? Okay. Yes. Um, thank you. This is really can you pull that down a little bit? Thank you. Um, so you clearly know a lot about Mandela, and um, I wanted to ask you what your what are the public diplomacy lessons learned, in, in from your perspective, mm -hmm. um, from Mandela. Well, he was um, yes. I, I worked with him very closely. Um, I miss him every day, and I, the the big lesson to me was so I spent many hours with him interviewing him for, for uh, Long Walk to Freedom, his great autobiography. And um, so many people over the years have said to me, it's really extraordinary, isn't it, that he was in prison for 27 years and he's not the least bit bitter. <laughs> and I would always smile to myself because they weren't in the room when uh, you heard how, you know, how saddened and angry and frustrated and even bitter he was about, about his, his life being taken away from him, the things, some of the things in life that he loved more than anything, his family, being around children, w were taken away from him for 27 years. He was plenty bitter, but he also understood for him to form a new dispensation in South Africa, for him to bring black and white together, he could not be seen to be bitter for one second. And in fact, partially it's his nature to, be, to embrace the new thing and to go to the positive, but but the, the great public diplomat that he was, was that he never showed any bitterness. He never showed the fact that he, in fact, dwelt on the past to a great degree. Because he would always say, forget the past. We can't look back. We have to embrace the future. And that future is this non-racial democracy where every person in South Africa can achieve his or her, her own destiny. That was an incredible public diplomacy triumph. And I know what a great triumph it was because he hid that side of him from view. From the book? In the book? In, in, everywhere. I'm but revealing it to you now. I was going to say, um. though, OK. Uh, we talked about Pat Moynihan's mm -hmm. Every Man is Entitled to His Own Opinion and Not His Own Facts. And, and you were helped writing the book. And you did this interview. And you have just revealed this. But that's a very powerful thing to know, because all of us feel resentment and bitterness. And to know that he did, too. but how he got past it and transcended it, yes. wouldn't that be an important part of the story? Yes, and, 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 um, and you know, I wrote a, my own book uh, about him called Mandela's Way, where we, where we talked about this, because he, he used to use the same kind of formulation about courage and fear. Because during the interviews, he would talk about when he was in prison, and he would almost get assaulted, and he would say, you know, man, I was terrified. I was scared. And I was sitting there, and I was thinking, my God, Nelson Mandela is telling me that he was scared. And I said, really? You, you were scared? And he said, well, of course. It would be irrational not to be afraid. Courage ca came from triumphing over your fear, not from not fe feeling fear at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, the courageous man is not the person who doesn't feel fear. The courageous person, the courageous man, the courageous woman is the person who feels fear and does not let it hold you back from what you know you need to do. That was Nelson Mandela. That was why. He was a courageous man. OK, great. Yes? Hi, I'm Ruben. First, thank you for coming. My question is, your talk seems to be based on, I guess, going back to the top-down approach, where the US is, is going to be disseminating information to the public and to these other countries. But has there been talk about how to get the people involved or as active participants in your soft power to plug diplomacy process? It's a very good question. And I, and I, I generally think that anything that is top-down is, is going in the wrong direction. But we are a government. We do need to communicate. Um, we do want to communicate with people 
in a mass way and individually. I mean, part of this technology revolution and the social media revolution is that you can now communicate to individuals in a way that was never possible before. But in terms of inculcating the values that we're interested in, in terms of you know, promoting uh, free and fair elections, promoting a, a, a level legal playing field, promoting a meritocracy, that is done in a, in a much more powerful way at, at a peer-to-peer, person-to-person level. So part of, to me, the vision of public diplomacy is how do you promote that? How do you enable people to have conversations with each other across borders and not to have government-to-people communication or people-to-government communication? Um, that's the, you know, part of the promise uh, of the Arab Spring was that seemed to be happening, right? That that's se seemed to be people taking the initiative into their own hands, people talking with each other. Uh, it hasn't turned out exactly the way that, that we had expected, but, 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 but the predicate for that is out there now. It's, it's, it's all around the world. And so you have autocratic governments, you have authoritarian governments. That's precisely what they're afraid of, is that their own people will talk to each other. We do want to enable that in whatever way we can. Thanks. I want to ask one from social media. We're going to intersperse these coming in. This is from We Foxter. How can young people born into the digital generation help with the effectiveness of digital diplomacy? Well, I mean, I think people who, who have grown up in this generation, I mean, it is the language that they speak. It's the air that they breathe. I mean, I you know, frankly think it's not my generation, it's not our generation that is going to s solve this issue. Um, and everybody is a practitioner. Everybody is a public diplomat, right? Everybody in your own status as a citizen is a potential public diplomat, and you can use that. I mean, I would hope that individuals would be the trailblazers that you know, we as, as government can follow. OK, I'm, I, I'm wondering, though, if it, just a concrete example. Um, I'm interested in a field called news literacy, which is educating the people formerly known as the audience to yeah. be critical yeah. thinkers and, and look for evidence and sourcing. Um, and I'm just wondering if this answer to this question could be, you know, you, you need to think of original ways. I mean, I'm thinking of a Snopes website for Russia, mm -hmm. which would, of course, immediately be banned somehow, mm -hmm. uncensored. But, you know, that kind of thing. Are there ways to do a kind of concerted effort well, there's this, I mean, again, there's so much that's happening from the ground. Um, and, I mean, and, and the kind of the, the brilliance and beauty of social media is that the, the local becomes global and the global is also local. So in talking about this anti-ISIL messaging, and, and the president mentioned this in his uh, terrific speech at the UN, the hashtag not in my name, which is young Muslim mm -hmm. women and men, mm -hmm. you know, Going, creating a video that then lives on YouTube or lives online of people saying, this is not the true face of Islam. This is not what I believe. I mean, that has tremendous power. I mean, that is a tremendous public diplomacy tool. And by the way, that has nothing to do with the US government at all. I mean, we, we applaud it and we, we support it notionally. But, but to me, the real change will come from individuals in, every, in, in human hearts and human brains. I mean, that is ultimately where public diplomacy lives. So is your job going to be phased out? Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. As, no, but as I a mean, journalist, I ask that, this question a lot. Well, yes, I think, I think your job will be phased <laughs> out before <laughs> mine will be. Um, <laughs> but, um, but again, but what we're seeing is the, change, the new, new paradigms in journalism, yeah. uh, new paradigms in education, and certainly a new, new paradigm in public diplomacy. Now, it, again, in a, in a uh, nirvana situation where everybody embraces these wonderful values, there wouldn't be uh, the need for public diplomacy. So uh, I, I would hope my job could be phased out by the end of the, uh, of the term because we would achieved all these goals that we want. But obviously that, that isn't the case. And, and in fact, you know, we have to do a better job and, be, and a more forceful job in communicating our ideas and in rebutting the misinformation that's out there. So you get up every day and think, I can make a difference. Sure, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, compared to journalism, how, how does it rate um, you? You know, I was a, um, an idealist about journalism, and um, I always thought that I was in public service when I was in journalism as well. Um, you know, Thomas Jefferson's line about a country can never be free and ignorant, 
that democracy is actually based on, on an informed citizenship, the consent of citizens. Um, I felt that journalism had, had this unique role to play in American democracy. In fact, it's the only mm -hmm. area that is constitutionally protected in, in, in the First Amendment. So um, I think that's absolutely necessary. The free, space, free speech space needs to be uh, widened. Um, there needs to be great journalism all around the world. I'm a great promoter of that. But, um, but I do think when you are in government, um, there are levers that you can use that, that don't exist when you're a journalist. Um, there's ways of communicating, communication that, that don't exist. And um, I feel like I can make a greater difference, but in a different way. Huh, okay, yes. And I w I'm amazed at how little I knew when I was a journalist compared to how much I know now. Are you going to share it with journalists? No. no. <laughs> well, we share it with journalists every day. Yeah, but you're just so diplomatic. Okay, <laughs> okay. I get it. That's my new incarnation. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, there you are. I really appreciate your use of spaces when you're talking about um, the internet. Um, but my question is, going beyond social media, what is the State Department doing? What is public affairs doing? What does public diplomacy look like for you um, going beyond just social media, looking at other virtual spaces, um, you know, such as multiplayer games, uh, wikis, Reddit, uh, 4chan, right? We're seeing things that are happening, especially sort of abuses of you know, personal safety online, especially right. for women. So how are you looking at public diplomacy with well, it's funny. Players. I mean, we're, we try to be on every platform, and, and, and including Reddit, and we are on Reddit. Um, I mean, you mentioned multiplayer games. I mean, I, I'm the father of two teenage boys, and I, <laughs> I see the power of multiplayer games. I, I see the power of games, particularly in the education space, which is where there is a, a completely changing paradigm. Um, I, I don't know what the implications for that are in, uh, in the public diplomacy space. I'd, I'd, frankly, I'd love people to be able to think about that. And, and again, you know, we, we, um, we do a lot of things that we've done for a long time, even in this kind of post-war environment that's, that still exists in many ways. I think we need to transition to newer things, uh, newer platforms, using newer tools. Again, s similar message, but using newer tools. So if you want to come up with a with a multiplayer yeah. public diplomacy game, <laughs> that could be very big. That okay. could be huge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. um, this is another from uh, social media. Uh, Jay Panett says, could the speakers offer an example, or the speaker, of when a social media dialogue has substantively changed a policy? You know, um, one of the things that's come up with CSCC in this counter ISIL messaging is people say, well, have you, what success have you had? What metrics do you have? And, and the, the, the presidential order that created CSCC was very specific and focused on um, trying to interrupt the recruitment of Al Qaeda for young men. So, you know, I, I, hey. Uh, so the, the, the issue, though, is how do you have metrics like that? I mean, you can't actually measure that. Someone could say, you know what, I was thinking of going to Syria, and then I saw this tweet from CSCC, and I decided, you know what, I'm not going to do that anymore. Um, so it's very hard to, to measure the space and have metrics for it. But it's also incalculable, the advantage, if, if you do turn one young man away who decides not to go to Syria, and he might have been, you know, you know, ha had a, you know, fired a shoulder held missile and brought down an airplane or a helicopter and killed dozens or hundreds of people. How do you measure the value of that? It is incalculable. So um, th there is a tr an effort to try to measure things which are often not measurable. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to do them. So uh, I don't know always the effect of what we're doing in that Russian counter-information space and in the anti-ISIL space, but I still think we need to do it. Okay, yes. Hi, um, I'm Ji Sun. I actually used to run a TV station that is the South Korean version of the Russian TV station that you were talking mm -hmm. about. And I see these kind of TV stations based on the success that the Russians have been having popping up all over the place. Right. And the question that I uh, has haunted me throughout my uh, career at the, the TV station is, do you believe that this kind of uh, channel, the involvement of these, development of these channels and public diplomacy as a whole, are they really promoting world peace or are they really sort of um, 
tearing us apart because we're trying to say that this is my fact and this is my truth. Right. Um, well, I think, I, I think the latter. Um, um, but what's interesting is that in this information space now, there are a whole range of non-economic actors. So we, you know, in America, think that there is often a correlation between quality and profitability. News networks make money. They, you know, they do great and objective journalism. The Russians who have spent uh, billions of dollars in this space, the Chinese who are, have spent billions of dollars in this space, they're non-economic actors. They don't sell advertising. They don't sell subscriptions. Um, they're looking for an audience and they're looking to promote their point of view. That is something new. And I wouldn't ask NBC or CBS or CNN to compete against that, but I do think that the, that the US has to compete against that. At the same time as you have these new entities in the information space, you have one of the greatest uh, engines of American soft power is American popular culture. So one of the things I always say in the public diplomacy space is we, we can't compete against ourselves. I mean, I, I wouldn't argue that someone should make Citizen Kane now. Citizen Kane already exists. The power of American popular culture is gigantic, but it is a power that, to use terminology from my old life, it's losing share. There's been a rise of the rest. There's now, you know, popular content that comes from India, that comes from Turkey, that comes from China, that comes from Japan, comes from South Korea. Um, and American popular culture still has great power and great resonance and great reach. But it used to be the only game in town, right? I mean, when you're on an airplane now, you see, you see movies from 40 different countries. You know, 15 years ago, there were only American movies and maybe a few French and, and British ones. So, so we've lost share. We still have a, a lot of power. But I also don't think we should be competing against ourselves in terms of popular culture. But I do think we need to figure out a new way of communicating that's neither traditional journalism nor government propaganda to deal with these new actors in the information space. I don't know if that answers your question. What is that new okay. thing? That I don't know. It's a, you know, I do. I think it. I think it will. Ha I think it has to be invented. I think we're inventing it now. And um, I mean, I'm a big believer that that government communication doesn't have to be dull. You know, uh, why wouldn't someone necessarily uh, want to hear what a what a uh, you know an assistant secretary of state has to say about something, or, or the national security advisor at the White House who has, to, who has something to say about something, which is not propaganda, but it's like, here, here is someone who knows a great deal about a situation who can help explain it. Um, is that news? Is that entertainment? Right. Is that something else? So I think that is um, going to be born. There's, uh, some of the folks here know him, so there's a new CEO designate for, for the Broadcasting Board of Governors, which is the in international broadcasting arm of the U.S. government, Andy Lack, uh, who is one of the great uh, storytellers and journalists of, of our generation. I mean, I think he will help invent a new way of communicating, a new kind of U.S. international broadcasting. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm an MPD Master of Public Diplomacy student, and uh, we hear so much about the importance of listening in public diplomacy. So mm -hmm. I wanted to ask, what does your office do um, in order to make sure you're, in terms of listening, mm -hmm. in ter to make sure that you are dealing with the proper context, not just with um, foreign audiences that you're trying to influence, but also piggybacking off of what we talked about mm -hmm. before, as far as people in the United States being able to participate in the conversation in hearing what the people here in this country are really most interested. Well, again, to go, to go back to the technology discussion, I mean, social media is the greatest tool for listening that, that has ever been invented. I mean, once upon a time, public diplomacy was, you know, the cathedral was top down. We had a message, we had a press release, let's just release it, and you really had no way of hearing what people said. You know, now that we're on all of these different platforms, you hear response from people. You know, there, there's, yes, there are the trolls and there are the people who will say you're full of it no matter what you say, but it's a way of listening. And one of the things that I feel that I do bring to the job is that when you're in the media business, you pay incredible attention to your audience. Um, you know who your subscribers are. You know what they're interested in. You know what, what they want to have. You know, the, 
the government and the State Department doesn't necessarily do that. I mean, a wise man once said that um, governments talk to people through the press and people talk to governments through polls. That was the way that people listened, but through polls. Now we can still listen to that way, but we can listen in a much more textured, nuanced, individual way using social media, using feedback, being in that conversation. To me, the challenge is, after you listen, what do you say? We're so not used to listening uh, that we don't always know how to have that conversation. That after you give me your opinion and I give you my opinion, what happens then? That is, as I was saying before, that is the kind of public diplomacy of the 21st century, and that still needs to be invented. Do you feel that that actually influences the actions that you take? I, well, I, it, 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 it influences our, our uh, creation of policy, I think. It, the, we see people's reaction to policy. Again, part of the, the old traditional part of public diplomacy, which I think still exists, is you have to be in on the takeoff if you want us to have, you, if you want us to give you cover on the landing, right? I think now, you know, my boss, you know, John Kerry is very, very smart and savvy about figuring out the public diplomacy implications of policy, right? I think the best policymakers factor that in, in terms of thinking about what policy is. In fact, more and more they're indistinguishable. Um, so, I think that does influence policy, and that really is in part about listening. And okay. is there a whole room at the State Department where people are monitoring Twitter feeds from around the world in different languages? Well, the you know the the uh, the you know public affairs, which is a right. which is a department under under our does a, a tremendous work with that all the time. They're monitoring the response to American policy, to American statements. Uh, certainly, the Ukraine Task Force (CSCC) is doing that in real time. So, so yes, yeah, so, I mean we're moving not even moving into the future or moving into the present. But you'd like to see the response time on that quickened? Yeah, I just think yeah. that, that, that so much of how of this conversation we're talking about is shaped in real time. So you know now, so I did a, um, a bunch of interviews, five interviews in a row uh, last Monday about anti-ISIL messaging. And by the time I got back to my office um, after the fifth interview, three or four of the interviewers had tweeted out Here's the money quote, you know, yeah. he says this, he says that. So there, once upon a time, the, the, the response would be, well, we'll watch the story and then we'll react to it. Now, journalists, practitioners are shaping the story even before the story is out. So I feel like as a, as a, as a government, as a State Department, as, a, as public diplomacy practitioners, we need to be in that conversation. We need to shape the response in real time. We can't be on our back foot about that. We have time for one more question. I'll get to you in a second. But um, ATVN, which is our TV news station here, and here's our reporter, um, they were asking me before we came in, you know, I want to, we, we want to cover this, but we don't understand what soft power is. So could somebody define that for anybody who doesn't? Could you define that? Well, actually, you, you put the question to everybody here. You all are studying public diplomacy. I, I would love to hear the definition. I haven't studied it. I'm trying to practice it. Oh, no, you have to do better than that. If, you, if this girl asks you, what is soft power? What do you mean by that? S soft power is the communications between people about policy. Um, and, and basically, from a government perspective, it's, it's, it's putting policy and people together. That is what soft power is. That's what public diplomacy is. OK. Does that help? OK. <laughs> You have to say yes. <laughs> yes, she has, yeah. she has to say yes. I just wanted to get the, the terms down so that everybody who's here reporting on it could understand. Yes, one last question. Oh, nervous. Um, hi, thank you so much for coming here today. Um, can I ask you for some advice? Sure. OK. So me and some friends, we started this group on campus. And our main goal is to bridge the gap between international and domestic students. We've gotten between a lot international and domestic students. Yeah, right. here at USC. And we've gotten a lot of international students to join us because they're really interested in what we want to do. But it's been really difficult getting domestic students to join. Do you have any advice for us for how we can, I don't know, like get more domestic students involved? Um, anybody know what percentage of Americans have passports? What's that? Under 30%. Under 30%? OK. Yes. I think it, I, I mean, again, I'm now a government official, so I don't want to get it wrong. But it's something like 16 or 17% of Americans have passports. Wow. Um, 
let's check that before I you know, get myself <laughs> in, in, in hot water. Um, um, you know, part of the, you know, the, the beauty of America is that, um, that you, know, you know, people sometimes live in an island where they're not aware of, of, of what's going on around them. And, and, and part of it, I think, would be to attract, you know, Amer American students to, you know, what is it about, you know, your culture or the culture of people that, that, that are involved that, that links up with Americans that, that's similar. We like what we like. And I think part of it is not showing, hey, we're different from you, but here's how we're the same. And I think that would create this kind of synergy to, to grow it between American and international students. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that. Thank you. Okay. It's terrific. And Peter, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to Jay Wong, and thanks to Phil Sieve, and all of you who put this together. Appreciate you all okay. coming. Thank you. Thank you.